This first reading is a farewell letter to some of the pilgrims who founded this great nation. A thing there is carefully to be provided for, to wit, that with your common employments you join common affections, truly bent upon the general good, avoiding the deadly plague of both your common and special comfort all retiredness of mind for proper advantage, and all singularly affected any manner of way. Let every man repress in himself, and the whole body in each person, as so many rebels against the common good, all private respects of men's selves, not sorting with the general convenience. And as men are careful not to have a new house shaken with any violence before it be well settled, and the parts firmly knit, so be you, I beseech, beseech you, brethren, much more careful that the house of God, which you are and are to be, be not shaken with unnecessary novelties or other oppositions at the first settling thereof. An unfeigned well-willer of your happy success, or success in this hopeful voyage. John Robinson, Farewell letter to the pil pilgrims, Leyden, Holland, June the 30th, 1621. I'm not sure that this next reading was designed to be read by a guy with a British accent. <laughs> but here goes. We hold these truths to be self-evident. <laughs> that all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter and to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundations upon such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evil evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. John Hancock, President, Declaration of Independence, July the 4th, 1776.
Observe good faith and justice towards all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. Religion and morality enjoin this conduct, and can it be that good policy does not equally enjoin it? It will be worthy of a free, enlightened, and no distant period, a great nation, to give to mankind the magnanimous and too novel example of a people always guided by an exalted justice and benevolence. Who can doubt that in the course of time and things, the fruits of such a plan would richly repay any temporary advantages which might be lost by a steady adherence to it? Can it be that Providence has not connected the permanent felicity of a nation with its virtue? The experiment, at least, is recommended by every sentiment which ennobles human nature. Alas, is it rendered impossible by its vices? In the execution of such a plan, nothing is more essential than that permanent, inveterate antipathies, antipathies against particular nations and passionate attachments for others should be excluded, and that in place of them, just and amicable feelings towards all should be cultivated. The nation which indulges toward another habitual hatred or habitual fondness is in some degree a slave. It is a slave either to its animosity or to its affection, either of which is sufficient to lead it astray from its duty and its interests. George Washington, Farewell Address, September 19th, 1796.
I didn't know I was a slave until I found out I couldn't do the things I wanted. My last hope had been extinguished. My master, who I did not venture to hope would protect me as a man, had even now refused to protect me as his property, and had cast me back, covered with reproaches and bruises, into the hands of a stranger, to that mercy which was the soul of the religion he professed. I was loved by the colored people because they thought I was hated for my knowledge and persecuted because I was feared. I was the only slave now in that region who could read or write. There had been one other man belonging to Mr. Hugh Hamilton who could read. His name was Jim. But he, poor fellow, had shortly after my coming into the neighborhood been sold off to the far south. I saw Jim ironed in the car to be carried to Easton for sale, pinioned like a yearling for the slaughter. To my knowledge was now the pride of my brother slaves. Frederick Douglass, My Bondage and My Freedom, 1855.
The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequalled magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and to provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations, order has been maintained, the laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. I commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes, to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and unity. Abraham Lincoln, Thanksgiving Proclamation, October the 3rd, 1863. We all know that something is eternal, and it ain't houses, and it ain't names, and it ain't earth, and it ain't even the stars. Everyone knows in their bones that something is eternal, and that something has to do with human beings. All the greatest people who ever lived have been telling us that for 5,000 years, and yet you'd be surprised how people are always losing hold of it. There's something way down deep that's eternal about every human being. Let's really look at one another. It goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. I didn't realize. So all that was going on and we never noticed. Wait, one more look. Goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners, Mama and Papa. Goodbye to clocks ticking and Mama's sunflowers. 
and food and coffee, and new iron dresses and hot baths, and sleeping and waking up. Oh, Earth, you are too wonderful for anybody to realize you. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? Every, every minute? Thornton Wilder, Our Town, 1938. We live at a breathtaking, excuse me, we live at a breathtaking pace, and such a pace cannot help but create new ills as it dispels the old, new ignorance, new problems, new dangers. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer, to rest and to wait. But this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested. This country was conquered by those who moved forward and so it will be with space. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won. And they must be won and used for the progress of all people. For space science, like nuclear science and all technology, has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a terrifying new theater of war. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win, and the others too. The great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it? He said, because it's there. Well, space is there, and we're going to climb it, and the moon and the planets are there, and new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on this most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure 
on which man has ever embarked. John F. Kennedy, The Moon Speech, September the 12th, 1962. traveled the length and breadth of Alabama, Mississippi, and all the other southern states. On sweltering summer days and crisp autumn mornings, I have looked at the South's beautiful churches with their lofty spires pointing heavenward. I have beheld the impressive outlines of her massive religious education buildings. Over and over, I have found myself asking, what kind of people worship there? Who is their God? Where were their voices when the lips of Governor Barnett dripped with words of interposition and nullification? Where were they when Governor Wallace gave a clarion call for defiance and hatred? Where were their voices of support when bruised and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of complacency to the bright hill of creative process? Yes, these questions are still in my mind. In deep disappointment have I wept over the laxity of the church. But be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is no deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? I am in the rather unique position of being the son, the grandson, and the great-grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ. But oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being nonconformists. Martin Luther King, letter from Birmingham Jail, April 16th, 1963.
Social life is disappointing. The very franticness of attempts to re-establish community in festival, by partying, by groups, by clubs, by touristy Mardi Gras, is the best evidence of the loss of true community in festival and of the loneliness of self, stranded as it is, an unspeakable consciousness in a world from which it perceives itself as somehow estranged, stranded even within its own body, with which it sees no clear connection. But there remains one unquestioned benefit of science, the longer and healthier life made possible by modern medicine, the shorter work hours made possible by technology, hence what is perceived as the one certain reward of the dreary life of home and marketplace, recreation. Walker Percy, Lost in the Cosmos, The Self-Help Book, 1983. Lovers must not, like usurers, live for themselves alone. They must finally turn from their gaze at one another back towards the community. If they had only themselves to consider, lovers would not need to marry, but they must think of others and of other things. They say their vows to the community as much as to one another, and the community gathers around them to hear and to wish them well on their behalf and on its own. It gathers around them because it understands how necessary, how joyful, and how fearful this joining is. These lovers, pledging themselves to one another until death, are giving themselves away, and they are joined by this as no law or contract could join them. Lovers then die into their union with one another as a soul dies into its union with God. And so here, at the very heart of community life, we find not something to sell, as in the public market, but this momentous giving. And if the community cannot protect this giving, it can protect nothing. Wendell Berry Sex, Economy, Freedom and Community, 1993.
Thank you, David Horowitz, Jack Cavari, Jonathan Fritz for your beautiful music. Thank you, Tony Hendra, for your marvelous voice tonight.